I'm Jeff Fritz with Soundstage.com, and I'm joined today by Gary Dayton. He is the Vice President of Sales for Bryston, and James Tanner, the Vice President of Marketing for Bryston. Guys, how are you doing today? Doing great. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing doing really good. It's it's raining down here in North Carolina, but uh, but otherwise, it's uh, looks like it's going to be a good day. It's a good day to sit inside and listen to music, Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, what I wanted to the, talk to you guys to about money. today, I, I was doing a little bit of research on your product line, and you know, I noticed mm-hmm. that the cubed amplifiers are are about four years old now. They were introduced in 2016. And uh, but I still see a lot of a lot of discussion about those amplifiers. I still see, you know, daily we have people that write in that uh, have purchased or are thinking about purchasing a Bryston amplifier. And uh, it seems like that line is still going pretty strong for you guys. And so, you know, what I wanted to discuss was actually the importance of a power amplifier to an audio system. Uh, but before we get into that too much, can you give me a rundown of the cubed amplifier series, kind of where it stands right now, you know, maybe what the most popular models are, and uh, just kind of the breakdown of that series? Sure. Do you want to handle that, Gary? Do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead, James. Um, yeah, it's about four years in. Now, typically what we find, Jeff, is that generally the, the technology changes. If I look back over our 50 years of doing this, technology changes about every seven to eight years so usually you get a reasonable run on stuff and we don't usually jump into things if they're sort of new and fresh today it's it's something that we do a lot of research on so when we decided to go to the cube series that was because certain technologies uh, were available to us to actually implement and we now have a patent on that system by the way um so that's really the, the changes so four years in is not really a long time in based on the type of performance and the type of amplifiers we've built so the Cube series, I know you have stereo, you have mono, and you have multi-channel amplifiers. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And so the other thing that is is pretty obvious about the line is most of the stereo models also come in a mono version as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between the two as far as the designs are concerned? Yeah, the mono versions are typically um, what we call a series version. It's not sort of mono in the sense of, you know, taking a stereo amp and then bridging it, per se. It's actually um, called a series mode um, uh, technology. So you you don't run into the same kind of situations you do when, you know, you typically bridge an amplifier. You have to worry about the lower impedance, that kind of thing. It actually compensates for that. And the other advantage of the series mode, which is the 7B, the 14B, and the 28B, is they're considered what they call fully balanced um, from input to output. So some people feel that that's a positive thing to be doing. We're doing it more as an outcome of the fact that it's a series mode amplifier, not that we necessarily feel that that's a better way to amplify per se. Okay, so you're saying that the mono versions are fully balanced, whereas the stereo versions would not be, correct? Uh, they're, They're differentially balanced at their input, but okay. they're then they single ended at that point. So the difference, the balancing input is important because you're getting rid of any noise on the line. Okay. Okay. All right. And so what are the most popular models? I know one of our reviewers, Jason Thorpe, he actually has a 4B uh, amplifier, which I know has been around uh, pretty much since the beginning of audio, it seems, you know, in one incarnation or another, but what, what, you know, I'm sure that's probably one of the most popular, but what are the most popular models that you guys have? I'll let Gary answer that because he's more involved with the direct sales uh, in, the, in the market. Yeah, well, the 4B has been uh, our most popular product every year, you know, with the exception of maybe two years. You know, and that's not just the most popular amp. That's the most popular product. You know, a couple of years, the BDA3 was the most popular. But, uh, yeah, so the 4B by far and away is is the most popular amp. But we do a lot of 7Bs as well. You know, I think that's a, that's a, a really solid mono block for a lot of people. Um, you know, it's got more power than most people are ever going to need. You know, it's still reasonably compact. You know, it's not gigantic. It's only three U tall, you know, weighs the same as a, uh, as a, as a 4B. Um, and then, you know, it's a single 7B is the same price as a 4B. So it's, you know, it's expensive enough to be really good, but it's not so expensive to be super scary. But then on the other side of it, you know, we're doing a lot of 2.5Bs these days. You know, the, the 2.5B actually followed our B135 integrated. So that's, it's just a little, you know, two by 135 watt 
amp. Um, you know, it's about two U tall. It's not terribly expensive. You know, it's small, but it sounds fantastic. You know, and the price is is really good. So we find that to be a really nice way for people to get into Bryston amps. You know, that might be stepping up from something a little lighter weight. You know, like an NAD or an older Rotel or something like that. So that that brings me to my next question. The the seven B. You know, I was looking at that on on your website and. You know, right above it is the 14B, which is, I guess, the stereo version of the 28B, which is your flagship. So if, if you had a customer that came to you and was looking at the 7B, but they're also looking uh, at a pair of 7Bs or the 14B stereo amplifier, can you give us a, you know, what, what would be your answer there? And is there a difference in, in price between the, the big stereo and the smaller monos? Yeah, so the, the 7Bs and the 14B are basically the same. I mean, I think other than just a little bit of difference in power supply capacitance, um, you know, there's there's virtually no difference between a pair of 7Bs and a, and a 14B. So the decision often comes down to uh, convenience of packaging. You know, some people really like to have a pair of mono blocks they can locate next to the speaker, use a really short length of loudspeaker wire, and, uh, you know, and get that advantage of, of mono blocks. But other people only have one shelf left in the rack. You know, and they need the power, you know, that's available in, in mono, so they'll get it all in a 14B. Um, whenever I go out and travel to dealers and I try and take a, you know, big amps around, I like to do 7Bs because it's a lot easier to carry two 50-pound amps, you know, back and forth to the car <laughs> than 100-pound amp <laughs> back and yeah. forth to the car. You know, so that matters. I mean, if, uh, if if you're moving or if you like to kind of change things around in your system, you know, moving 7Bs, you know, is a lot easier than moving a single 14B. Um, but all of our amplifiers, regardless of how many channels are in the box, are monaural anyway. Um, every channel always has, you know, it's a fully independent power supply, including transformer. So it's not like there's an inherent performance advantage, you know, of the 7Bs over the 14B. You do save a little bit of money with the 14B. I think it's like a thousand bucks or something like that, uh, okay. yeah, James. But um, but that's really just a function of the fact that you're buying a single chassis and dress panel instead of two chassis and dress panels. Okay. And so, you know, you guys have been building amplifiers for, for a long time. And, you know, we mentioned that the 4B has been a staple in the product line for uh, many, many years. So if you had a, a customer and they've got an, an older 4B, you know, maybe back a couple of generations, um, what would you say to that person who's thinking, well, you know, would it be worth my, worth my time and my money to upgrade to a new cubed model? Uh, you know, what sonic benefits am I, am I going to see uh, or am I going to hear? Um, what, what would you say to that customer who's thinking about upgrading, but they've still got a really good, you know, older model Bryston amp? Hey, Jeff, I would say two major things with the amplifiers, but I, I, I've always sort of looked at audio as sort of think of it as a barbed wire. Remember the old phrase, the straight wire with gain? Right. Um, think of it as a barbed wire, and basically over the years, what we've been able to do is sand down those barbs. So you've got less and less distortion. So if you look at the Cube series, let's say, versus the original 4B as an example, there are two major differences. One is called first to last watt, would be something I would throw at you. And the other one would be um, essentially lower and lower noise floors. Like if we were fortunate in the early days to get a 100 dB signal to noise ratio, for instance. Now we're approaching 130. Uh, when, you know, which is a, a wow. theoretical theoretical limit of the actual devices you're using in terms of the transistors and the resistors and things. The first, and uh, if you look at the Cube series, the major change that we had was on the input stage. And the difference there was because we ended up having a situation where um, we could reject noise coming into the input stage by an extra 20 dB. I mean, it's substantial, very substantial. So what does that mean in terms of listening, obviously? A, a very, very black background in terms of being able to resolve very, very low micro type details and things. So that was a, a major change. And the distortion went down a little bit, the IM and the so on, but it was mainly that input stage that made it, made it change. Now, the first a lot watt thing is based on this, that most power amplifiers, if you look at their distortion spectrum, tends to rise um, in, in, once you go beyond, um, you know, when you go down low as opposed to over. So usually most amps operate their most linear at, say, one-third power. With the um, Cube series, we've been able to get it, whether it's one watt or a thousand watts, you know, the, the distortion spectrum is identical. Okay, okay. 
Well, that really makes it easy as far as matching with a loudspeaker, right? No matter what sensitivity loudspeaker you have, you're you're essentially going to get the same performance out of the uh, the amplifier, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so the last question I have as far as the amplifiers are concerned, if, if someone were to go out and purchase a cubed amplifier, let's say they're considering a cubed amplifier today, and they ask you, you know, how long is this amplifier going to be uh, going to be good for? I know you guys have a 20-year warranty, which is really, uh, you guys set the standard in the industry as far as that's concerned, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and, and, you know, that's something that you guys have, you know, it's obviously a great selling point for your for your amplifier line. But if somebody were to say, you know, when is this thing going to be outdated? You know, I know that that's probably a more loaded question if you're talking about digital to analog converters. But when it comes to amplifiers, you know, my, my opinion has been if you buy a good amp today, it's it's really a good investment for years because it's a good amp today is going to be a good amp tomorrow. But what is what is your answer when someone says, you know, I'm thinking about buying this amplifier. Is it going to be is it going to be obsolete in five years or seven years? What's your what's your reaction to that? I think everybody should should always buy components expecting that they are going to keep them forever. Like that's the only way to know that you're really going to be happy. Now, if you want to, you know, succumb to upgrade fever, like do it. You know, like absolutely. If you want to buy, you know, something new and shiny and better, you know, and you're able to do so go for it but but i don't think that um that that's really any different than 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 any other component um you're right jeff that a good amp today you know is a good amp you know 20 years from now and the fact that we build our amplifiers you know to be so robust and to perform as new for you know for 20 years or longer you know i think should really bolster somebody's confidence you know in in our products um because we design our gear to be neutral and to not have a specific taste or flavor means that uh, you know as you upgrade your front end and your loudspeakers, you know the amplifier in the middle is going to be able to resolve the differences in both you know upstream and, and downstream gear. So you know a good amp is going to make it possible for you to really appreciate you know upgrades elsewhere in your system as you grow. But you know like James said at the beginning of the interview, you know we put a lot of research and development and a lot of time you know, into the Cube series, but we did the same with the SST squared. We did the same with the SST, and then when Stuart Taylor joined us, uh, you know, in the late '80s, you know, Stuart brought you know an awful lot of knowledge. So it, it took, it's taken us years, almost 50 years, I guess, to get to our seventh generation amplifier. Um, and you know, we're not slow just for the sake of being slow, but you know, we don't want to be the kind of company that just trickles out these you know little incremental upgrades, you know, over the right. years and charges a whole bunch more money for it. Um, you know, we want to make sure that the upgrade is something that's substantial and impactful for us, you know, that, that we can really enjoy. Um, but, you know, that said, you know, if uh, if you get, you know, five or 10 years into your ownership of a Bryston amp and you want to upgrade, do it. You know, come here. You know what we're doing these days. You know, we just launched our 4B trade in program uh, just uh, earlier this week where, you know, anybody that owns, you know, a 4B from any previous generation can trade it in against a cube series and get a pretty substantial amount of money back for it. Um, I mean, even the original 4B, you know, we're given almost 600 bucks for, which, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, James, but that's somewhere around half of what it originally retailed for. Well, I'll tell you a really good story. When I first started with Bryston, they called me and said, do you want to be the Canadian sales manager? And I said, foolishly, why not? And um, I went into my first uh, hi-fi store, and I had the first 4B ever made. And I said to the guy, you know, I'm here from Bryston. My name's James. Here's, a, here's our amplifier. Would you be interested? And he sat me down. I went through my whole spiel. And then he looked at me, and he said, hey, James, when uh, people start asking for it, I'll, uh, I'll give you a call. And that was sort of the, the attitude, right? But it was $1,200. And I can remember thinking, who the hell is going to spend $1,200 on an amplifier? <laughs> So there's an example of the, how far back it goes, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, we were actually discussing your upgrade uh, program on our soundstage internal email list the other day. And, you know, right. several of our writers commented that you guys are, are pretty aggressive in what you're offering as a trade-in value. It really kind of takes away the, uh, I guess, the incentive to go out and try to sell it yourself because you guys are, I mean, you guys are really making it easy for people to want to upgrade. Yeah, well, like as an, as an individual, selling used gear is hard. You know, like I mean, I've done it. Um, you know, I had a, an old Wadia DAC 
you know, that I had for years and years and I loved it and it was a great DAC and I took great care of it. You know, I sold it, you know, shipped it to the guy. He said, it's broken. I said, it's not. We had to go through PayPal arbitration and yada, yada, yada. It's like, oh man, you know, by the time it was all over with, you know, I wish I had just given it to my best friend. Um, <laughs> and so, and I think that's, that's a real barrier for people, you know, trying to sell high end gear. Um, you know, so if we can give somebody, you know, right around what they would get, you know, on the, on the private market and, you know, make it easy for them to upgrade to Bryson and stick with us, you know, then I think it, it's good for us. It's good for the customer and, and hopefully good for the shop in the middle. Well, yeah, so, I yeah. mean, it's a situation where that 20 year warranty really fits, uh, fits in here because with the quality level we build, they really do hold their value. So even the very old used product has value in the market segment. Plus, plus someone that, that ends up with that amplifier knows that it can be fixed by the company if, if something goes wrong. Exactly. Yeah. So I appreciate the uh, the update on the cubed amplifiers. And I want to finish up the interview today by asking you guys, what is, you know, since we've had the, the lockdown due to the pandemic, what's been a favorite recent listening experience? It could be a piece of music or uh, something that you've heard at a system of uh, maybe visiting a customer at the factory or just sitting in front of your computer for that matter. And uh, James, let's start with you. Well, I've been uh, downloading every John Klein album I can find. Um, so given his situation, I mean, I always liked his stuff. So I've been, I've probably got about 10 albums downloaded now. So the last few days I've been actually sitting listening to uh, most of his stuff. All right, Gary? I don't know where he went. Sorry, I had to go. I had to go oh. plug a record. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> um, we picked up a new dealer in Chicago uh, just at the beginning of the year because uh, I think the longest running Bryson dealer on the planet closed, and that was Audio Consultants. And um, and Lenny Mayu from uh, who's working at MoFi now, used to work at Audience, introduced me to Tim Schroeder at Schroeder Amplification. And, and Tim and I really hit it off, you know, just from a musical taste point of view. And uh, and Tim was cool enough to send me a box of records uh, a few weeks ago of just stuff that he's, you know, really been into. You know, artists that uh, that he works with because his main gig is building guitar amplifiers. And um, and this Bill McKay record in particular is one that probably hasn't left my turntable, but for a couple of times, you know, since since I got it. So this is a guy that does things with a guitar that I didn't really know were possible, but in such a musical and fun way. So thanks, no, Tim. That's, that's definitely you know, a good tip. <laughs> Well, guys, thank you. I appreciate your time today. And, uh, you know, I, I really am, am happy that we're able to, you know, educate people a little bit more on the cubed amplifiers. I think, you know, as much email as we get on, on those, those products, like I said, you know, four years in and, you know, they don't seem to be slowing down. So I appreciate, appreciate the update. Oh, thank no you. Problem, sir. Take care. All right. We'll see you.